Okay. Um, my program today is on building mental muscle. And it, one of the things I, I did web, webinars a long time ago and I haven't done them in a while. So one of the things that's come back uh, doing them more recently is how weird it is when you're talking to dead silence. So it is kind of nice at least being able to see the faces of the panelists, but I'm going to assume that you are um, responding enthusiastically to my questions and enjoying yourself immensely. So think about the current situation that we are in the country. I mean, imagine it's probably on your mind a little bit every single day. I mean, we've got COVID. The emotions that are created by people who are wearing masks or not wearing masks. We've got the same for social distancing. Are people social distancing? Are they not? Or do you mind? Or is it okay with you? Um, what will become of children educate, being educated from home? Um, people worry about elderly parents, the economy, concern about sales and business, job loss, whether or not people are going to find out what color our hair really is, and will we have enough toilet paper? All, you know, all these kinds of things are running through our heads at any time of day. And, and that's just stuff that's happening now. I mean, when you, when you look back at what our lives were, if you can remember back to what our lives were before all of this, there's plenty of stuff to think about then, to get wrapped around the spoke of. And um, so just the stuff that's going on on a regular day-to-day -day basis, the issues that come up that you think about. Another area that is um, pretty prevalent in our thinking is something that's called the amygdala hijack. And that's a, a, a term that was coined by Daniel Goleman, who's the father of emotional intelligence. And what an amygdala hijack is, is an experience where your reaction to it is a, out of proportion to the event itself. And it's where that fight, flight, freeze, or I add fold comes into it, where it just, it's, it's the thing that used to be for, to protect us from getting eaten by a bear, but now often it's still, it, it comes up, but in reaction to someone, um, to a situation that's really uncomfortable, there's just someone that you don't like, or to someone that pushes your triggers, you know, whatever it is. So there's another situation where your brain is essentially in control of you. You're reacting in a way that has been in, that's been, the amygdala has been there for the entirety of our existence and it's still working in pretty much the same way it always has. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? I'd say in many cases, it's an unhelpful thing. So let's put all that stuff aside for a minute in terms of what, what's going on in our heads. Pretty clear to you all. Um, I want to talk about the things, that, the skills that you've learned over time. You've spent your entire life learning things. I mean, you learned how to walk. You learned how to read. Maybe you learned how to build a deck or put air in your tires. You certainly learned how to do your job and continue to learn how to do your job if you're a continuous learner. Whatever it is that you've learned how to do, at first it was foreign and difficult. Think about when you got behind the wheel of a car the first time, it just felt, okay, this is scary, this is weird, I don't know if I can do this. And as you practiced over time, it became more natural. It was just, oh, you don't even think about walking anymore, unless maybe you've had too many martinis and then you have to think really hard about it. But you just do it every day without thinking. It's just the way your brain works now. It has been trained to think in that way. The same thing with filling up your car or in some parts, some parts of doing your job, you can kind of do them without thinking. It's the way your brain has already been trained to do that. And that's because of neuroplasticity. Your brain has the ability to change. You can make your brain change with effort. You didn't know something before and now you do. And the reason that is the case is due to neuroplasticity. So this is, the, this is where I get into the part of the presentation where people may do a lot of eye rolling or run screaming from the room. But I, I want you to, it's only gonna be about 15 more minutes. So, so hang in there. And if you stay with me to the end and you still think it's a bunch of bunk, then I, I respect that. But I wanna talk to you about the thing that you can do that will make you, that will train your brain for you. The one thing that you can do that will absolutely train your brain, and that's meditation. And before, before you leave or say, oh yeah, 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 I've heard that before, 
I want to tell you, I was in the same camp of people saying, yeah, I'm not sure it's for me because I tried for a decade, probably more than a decade to develop a meditation practice. All the things that I've heard about what it can do for you and all the science about how people who do it, um, their, their brains are different and better than the average person. And so I thought, I know that there's good reason to do this, but I couldn't do it. And there was a few reasons why. One, um, it was a little too woo-woo for me. Uh, I was afraid that I was going to have to start wearing tie-dye and burning incense in my house. There is nothing wrong with either one of those things. It's just not me. And I felt like it was a, a way more of a, um, an earthy, um, um, hippie kind of activity. And, and it just didn't align with who I am and it didn't feel right. So that was one reason I didn't do it. The other was that um, you had to sit on the floor, in the middle of the floor, maybe on a cushion, but um, sitting up straight, cross-legged on the floor for a long time. And I can't do that. It's really uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable for my back. I mean, you know, very quickly, it would be that aches and pains I never knew I had. It's like, yeah, this isn't working. I'm not concentrating on, I'm not clearing my mind. I am focusing on how much everything hurts. And that the second, the third thing was what I mentioned in the second thing was that I was never unable to clear, I was never able to clear my mind. I thought that you had to be able to clear your mind to meditate. So something changed, obviously, or I wouldn't be talking to you about the importance of this, this skill to develop. Here's what changed for me. One, I learned that it's not all hippies and incense and that you don't have to sit cross-legged in the middle of the floor. I learned that it's not about clearing your head at all. In fact, success in the practice is if you sit and you decide to meditate for two minutes and you decide in that two minutes that you're gonna focus on your breath. So you focus on your breath and very quickly your brain has gone off to something else. The second you realize that you have gone off to something else is when you are succeeding at meditation. When you, when you were supposed to be, we meant you intended to be focusing on your breath and now you're thinking about payroll. And then you think, oh wait, I'm, this isn't the time to think about payroll. I wanna focus on my breathing. The second that you recognize that and go back, you are succeeding at meditation. And that may happen a thousand times in two minutes. What you're doing is you're practicing the ability to recognize when you are not in control of your thoughts. That's all it is. It's simply recognizing when you have started to get wrapped around the spoke of something that isn't helpful. And that's one of the key pieces of it too. When you recognize that you've stopped focusing on whatever it was, and it could be a, a, a word you're saying. If you like to be one of those people who say "ohm," you can do that. I mean, there's a ton of different ways that you can you can do this, whatever works for you. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the second that you realize you're not doing that, and even if it's been five minutes that you've been lost in thought, and now you realize, oh yeah, I wanted to be back practicing. That's the practice of meditation, and that's why they call it a practice. It's because this isn't going to come naturally. Just like all the other things that you learned didn't come naturally, this won't either. It's going to be day after day after day after day that you do it a little bit at a time. And as you get better, you start to recognize sooner that you're, you're off on a tangent that may not be helpful to you. So let me tell you a little bit about my practice. And uh, it'll, I, I don't think I can live long enough to be considered someone who uh, is an expert on meditation. I mean, people who I've been learning from now have been doing it for, you know, some of them for 50 years. So uh, I've been doing it around um, 140 days every day, uh, somewhere between two and 30 minutes, and two minutes counts. One minute counts. Any little bit that you're doing counts. The other thing that's very interesting is that you don't have to be sitting on a cushion in the middle of the floor. You can sit on your sofa. You can be lying down. There are sleep meditations. 
You can meditation, meditate while you're walking. You can meditate while you're brushing your teeth. The idea is that all of those things that you're doing, you're just focusing what, on what you're doing at the time. And when you're brushing your teeth for two minutes, and I, I have one of those toothbrushes that, uh, those electric ones where it, it goes for two minutes so you know that you're brushing a long enough time. Well, in that two minutes, I try to focus on brushing my teeth. And when I realize I've thought about my day and I practice going back to, oh no, this is brushing my teeth time to think about that. Again, that's the meditative practice. You can sit on a chair. I mean, you can do it any way you like. You don't have to buy a meditation cushion. And if you have back or discomfort issues, you don't have to sit cross-legged. You don't have to do any of that stuff. What you're doing is training your brain. Um, sometimes it's related to a specific challenge. My, um, my husband uh, just got rift last week. And so a lot, of my motive, a lot of my meditation has been focused around that. And we're going to be okay. And my business does, does just fine and, and all that kind of thing. So, but it is kind of one of those things like, oh, wait, this is, this is a freak out. And, but how, how useful is it to stay in the place of freak out? It's zero use. It's, it's recognizing that wherever my brain is going, is this doing me any good or isn't it? Is it useful or is it not? The other thing with my practice is that I haven't made it too complicated. Now, I do use an app, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which allows you to have a streak. And the only reason the streak is helpful to me is I want to make sure I do it as often as possible. I mean, I, I tend to forget things. I, I usually don't refuse to do things. Um, well, if they have to do with um, banking and investments and stuff, I usually refuse to do them because I don't like that stuff. But in, in terms of this, I'm not refusing. I'm just not remembering. So getting into the routine of doing this, the streak thing helps. But the other thing is you're not failing if you forget to meditate for a day or two or three or five. It's just, you know, it's putting your practice back a little bit. It's, it's making you less far along on it feeling more natural or recognizing it more quickly, but you're, you're still doing okay. It's not a big deal. So the results of, of, of what you're trying to achieve here is your thoughts. You're neither trying to shove them away, nor are you trying to wallow in them. Because, because not allowing yourself to think about um, worry, worrisome stuff or stuff that's making you angry, not allowing yourself to think about it, does it fix it and does it make it go away? It's still in there and it's going to come out another way sometimes. You also don't want to wallow in it. I always, when I talk to clients, mm. they say when bad things happen, you're, you're allowed to wallow uh -huh. in it as long as at the same amount of time that you rejoice uh -huh. in your successes. That's you're allowed to wallow the equivalent amount of time that you re um, rejoice in your successes. And actually, in practice, that's not true, but we certainly rejoice a lot shorter than we wallow, just in our nature. It's noting, is this useful, what I'm thinking or what I'm not thinking? It's reactions to triggers. There are certain situations, as, as practiced as I can be, both in, in this and emotional intelligence, there are people in situations that trigger me and learning how to react better, learning how to, to slow down the, the amygdala hijack and behave in a way that is more in alignment with my core values and my beliefs, that's been a result. Still practicing and be practicing until the day I die on that. Um, you don't meditate to become a better meditator you meditate to navigate life more artfully. It's, you never hear a, 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 an accomplished meditator, someone who's been doing it for a long time, talk about how good a meditator they are. They really blanch at that kind of um, designation. They just, they're not gonna do it. You do it so that you live a better life, so that you can try to be a better person. It's not about what a great meditator one is. And here's, here's kind of a bonus. There, there, you hear tell, boy, I would love an exercise program where I can just sit on my couch and do nothing. This is one of them. You sit on your couch and you do nothing and you are exercising your brain. So that's a pretty great win. I want to give you a few resources, a couple resources, a book here. 
my my favorite where I where this shift happened for me was when I read a book. Actually, I listened to a book called Ten Percent Happier by a guy named Dan Harris, who was a correspondent for ABC and had an on air anxiety a panic attack anxiety attack. And from there began his journey into meditation. And he's he's kind of a hard edged cynical kind of guy. So I think the fact that and I'm not hard edged and cynical, but he's not woo woo. And so I think I could kind of relate to the things that drew, drove him away from meditation at first, but ultimately helped him. So he has a book, he has an app, he has a, um, a, a website where every single day at 2 central, 2 p.m. central, they do a live kind of discussion and meditation for 20 minutes, which if you can get on that is awesome. It's free and it's out, out there. Um, so I, I, that's been extremely helpful and it has all sorts of guided meditations and lessons and things like that. And the education has been extraordinarily helpful for me because I didn't learn all this stuff prior to this. I learned it all through the education and the practice of what I'm doing right now. And there's also a book, I'll just hold this up so that you can see it. It's called Meditation in a New York Minute. So if you're a really busy person and you don't have 20 minutes to meditate, this guy can tell you how to do it. And if you think, um, it's interesting, he was trained as a, an investment banker and he was the interim COO for JP Morgan. So, you know, this is a guy who was out there in the corporate world and he was doing all the big corporate stressful stuff before he moved into being uh, the meditation practice and ultimately a teacher. So I also recommend that because there's lots of ideas in there for how you can spend one minute training your brain. Um, I have uh, one more thing I want to say, but uh, Will, are there any questions that anybody has out there? We do have some questions. We've got about three minutes left. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, there were a couple of comments. I'm going to skip those and go to the questions. Um, Richard says, so the ideal meditation is being continually focused on your breathing and not wondering, question mark. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If you are, if that is the focus of your meditation at that point, because it, 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 in that session, because there's, there's different kinds of meditation. There's one, and this people will bristle sometimes at this too, but there's a loving kindness meditation where you're actually trying to focus on sending um, loving kindness to someone that really matters to you. Send it to someone that you don't know very well, but you interact with. Um, sending it to just the world in general, and then sending it to someone that you don't like. So it's, it's, it takes you through that whole, what you're thinking about in that time is focusing yourself on thinking about sending those kinds of thoughts, um, training your brain to think those kinds of thoughts, most for the, both for the people who are close to you, but also for the people who impact you some of the time and the world and people you don't like. And talk about a lesson trying to send loving kindness to people that you don't like, that will change your brain. Thanks, Next Mary. Uh, one quick one from Richard. Is there an ideal specific amount of time to meditate? And then Bill asked, uh, how do we recognize when we, are, when we are in victim mode and what do we need to get back on track? And you have to answer them fairly quickly. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Um, there, there isn't an ideal time. I mean, I would say start small. If you could do 10 minutes, I'd say that's great. If you could do 10 minutes every day for a month, that's great. Many of them are guided. That helps. And in terms of being a victim, I mean, that is getting wrapped around the spoke of the victimhood. So you, you have to, um, part of the education is learning when you have walk you've gotten yourself into victimhood when how do you recognize when you are starting to behave and think like a victim you've got to know that first and then you've got to recognize when your brain pattern has got, gone off into that so that you can say is this useful is thinking about me being a victim is this useful to me is this helping me move forward so that's kind of a two-step process all right, thank you, Mary. Um, You're very, and if, if, if anybody has any other questions, they're more than welcome to email me or, and I, I'm happy to chat with anybody at any time. I did also share the uh, link to that book that you mentioned uh, to the Amazon link in uh, Oh, chat. awesome, oh, awesome. And 10% and happier, the one I didn't have because I have an audio, um, that, that one's, a, a high, I highly recommend that one as well. A lot of education in there. 
He does cuss sometimes in it though, so if you don't like that, then stay away from that one. Thanks everybody. <laughs>